Presenting history's best on PBS. Hello, I'm Walter Cronkite. He only had an eighth grade education, yet for a dozen years the press referred to him as one of the most powerful people in the nation. In the darkest days of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt called on him to help save railroads, banks, farms, and businesses. When one old war loomed, the President turned to him again to help the Allied nations prepare for battle. But I first knew of him when I was growing up in Houston. It seemed like the tallest buildings in town all belonged to him. He was Jesse Holman Jones. Time magazine once reported, to many a U.S. citizen, great and small, if Jesse Jones says, okay, okay. And Jones' crony, humorous Will Rogers, was fond of saying, I get all my money information from Jesse Jones. In one way or another, so did the rest of the nation. He's a forgotten hero from one of the most important chapters in our nation's history. Brother, can you spare a billion? The story of Jesse H. Jones. Deep into the worst depression America has ever known, Houston, Texas is facing disaster. Two of the city's banks are on the verge of collapse. If they fail, banks across three states also will fail. It's already happening in other cities. Panic depositors line up to pull out their savings, creating runs on banks, bringing the nation's economy to the edge of collapse. But in Houston, one man sees a solution. Jesse Holman Jones, a local financier, summons the city's business leaders to a secret meeting and proposes a simple but radical idea, cooperation. If they pool their resources to keep the failing banks open, depositors won't panic and bank runs will be averted. But the skeptical businessmen balk. Some protest that it's every man for himself. Others question Jones's motives. But they have to listen to the shrewd business sense that had made Jesse Jones one of the richest men in Texas. Jones vows to keep them in his office until an agreement can be reached. It takes three steamy days and nights for him to convince the businessmen his plan is the only way to go. By saving the region's banking system and the life savings of thousands of people, Jesse Jones has made sure the banks of Houston, including his own, will survive the Great Depression. And that is classic Jesse Jones. Do the right thing. Do what's good for Houston. Do what's good for the country. But also, good business. Within months, Jones will face a bigger challenge. He'll be called to Washington to rescue the nation's banks and help President Franklin Roosevelt save the American capitalist system. As much as any other single figure, Jesse Jones saved the American economy in the depths of the Depression. He believed in an activist government. He knew it was necessary. He knew the Wall Street crowd had had their chance and they'd failed. He had billions of dollars at his disposal and he could give it anywhere he wanted to without the approval of anybody. One of the things his critics always said about him is that he was a large man with a large ego. He used Roosevelt, Roosevelt used him. One of the great untold stories of, of the New Deal, which we are starting to learn more about, is the role of this Houston banker in the grand scheme of the New Deal and the mobilization for World War II. A huge presence in 20th century America. That's Jesse Jones. <laughs> 
to me he was great Uncle Jess. I was one of a bunch of nieces and nephews who just adored him. But I was never sure why he was so famous. I know he helped fight the Great Depression, and he helped us win World War II. The national magazines called my great uncle the most powerful man in the nation, next to President Roosevelt. Washington is the great and powerful Jesse Holman Jones of Houston. But I always wondered how he got there. That's why I came here, to Robertson County, Tennessee. He was raised on a tobacco farm and never went past the eighth grade in school. But somehow, he got to Texas, made a fortune, and went to Washington and helped change the world. This is the farmhouse he was born in, April 5th, 1874. When Uncle Jess was 12, his father was doing pretty well in the tobacco business, and he moved the family here to a much bigger farm. This is the scale house. It was prized tobacco and all, and of course they'd have to weigh it. This is the old scale box that I'm sure he used. Jesse's dad put him in charge of his tobacco warehouse. It was his job to buy crops from the local farmers. Negotiating with men more than twice his age must have been a tough challenge for the 14-year-old boy. But he always said, this is where he discovered his business sense. I've heard he was more interested in buying and selling tobacco than he was raising it. He, uh. he, liked, he liked buying and selling it better yeah. than he raising it. Yeah. <laughs> By age 19, Jesse Jones had discovered two things. That he had a gift for business, and that his ambitions extended far beyond the family farm. His restless urge took him to Texas, where his prosperous uncle, M.T. Jones, owned a string of lumber yards. Cocky young Jesse went right to work managing his uncle's Dallas yard. But the young man soon took a dangerous gamble. It was 1897, and cyclomania, the bicycling craze, was sweeping the nation. When two promoters proposed a half-mile racing track at the local fairgrounds, Jesse enthusiastically agreed to provide all the lumber on credit. But the track took more lumber than MT's entire yard was worth. When the track finally opened, Jesse desperately hoped the gate receipts would repay the loan before Uncle M.T. caught on. It was a close call, but the loan was repaid with interest. And Jesse learned an early lesson he never forgot, the creative use of credit. By the time M.T. Jones died two years later, he had named his nephew an executor of his substantial estate. Jesse Jones headed to Houston to settle his uncle's affairs, and he soon discovered his uncle M.T. had left him something more useful than money. His uncle was an established civic leader, a rich man, and when he managed his estate, he managed this estate of over a million dollars. And in doing so, he met bankers, and businessmen all over the state of Texas. And Jesse wasted little time putting his new connections to work. First, he convinced the bankers he now knew to lend him enough money to buy his own lumber yard. Within a few years, he turned the one yard into a chain of 65. From dealing in lumber, he moved into building houses, which he sold on long-term credit. His aggressive lending soon earned him a nickname. 10% Jones for the interest rates he sometimes charged. 
lending and borrowing with equal success, he began to build a business empire, all of it on credit. More than one local banker worried that the young tycoon was way overextended. The story is often told that one of the local bankers came and said, Jesse, we heard the rumor that you've borrowed a million dollars. And he looked at him with a straight face and said, well, I'm sorry to tell you that rumor's wrong. I borrowed three million dollars, <laughs> which was an unheard of sum in 1905-1906, but he would routinely borrow in the millions. Jones' unorthodox business practices didn't always win him friends among Houston's business leaders, but they had to admire his success. Inevitably, he became a part of the city's high society. This was a man who was very tall, very handsome, exceedingly well-dressed, a bachelor, so uh, I think Mr. Jones must have cut a swath. Uncle Jess was one of Houston's most eligible bachelors. I know he had quite a way with the ladies. So at 30, why was he still not married? It was because he was waiting for the woman he truly loved, who was already taken. She was Mary Gibbs Jones, and she had a background Uncle Jess just did not have. She was educated, well-read, and world-traveled. From all accounts, she was attracted to him, too. There was just one problem. She was married to Uncle Jess's first cousin, Will Jones. According to family lore, Will was more interested in the good life than being a good husband. But back then, divorce was simply out of the question. So Uncle Jess visited Aunt Louisa and the extended Jones family as often as possible and stayed as close as he could to Mary and his cousin Will. The ambitious young man who was used to getting everything he wanted would have to wait 15 years to get the woman he loved. Meanwhile, his business ventures thrived, even while others floundered. In 1907, when a nationwide recession wiped out fortunes more stable than Jones's, skeptical Houstonians expected him to stumble. But he saw the panic coming and turned everything he could into cash. Jones emerged from the 1907 panic in better financial shape than almost anyone else in Houston. His business touched now tested by crisis. He was sure his success would come from building and banking. Within weeks, he made an announcement that astonished Houston. He would build three new downtown buildings taller than any the city had seen. He became half owner of the city's largest newspaper and invested in local banks. Why was he driven to make so much money? Even when he had a lot of money, why was he driven to make more and more and more? Perhaps because he considered this a game. He evidently did enjoy the simple art of making money. But Jones knew he would prosper only if Houston grew that Houston's success would help elevate the entire South. This idea, I think, comes partly from the fact that men like Jones had lived in small towns, small towns where the elite was responsible directly for things that happened, and they brought that image to Houston. In a way, it's saying, this is my destiny, and if Houston fails, so will I, and if Houston succeeds, then my horizons are almost unlimited. But Houston's growth was constrained by its geography. It had no deep water access to the sea. Jones took a lead role in getting federal funds to help dredge a deep channel to the Gulf of Mexico. In 
When it opened in 1914, the ship channel internationalized Houston overnight and boosted the economy of the entire region. It also turned the spotlight on the man who helped make it happen. He was well on his way from being called 10% Jones to a nickname that he liked much better, Mr. Houston. And his growing reputation brought him to the attention of the man who would change the course of his life, President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's reformist zeal already had captivated Jones. He was attracted by the president's promises to bust monopolies and promote the South and West. And Wilson saw in Jesse Jones a new progressive financier, independent of the powerful East Coast financial establishment. By 1917, Wilson had offered Jones two ambassadorships and the position of Secretary of Commerce. Jones was tempted but turned down the president to continue building his business and his city. But when America entered World War I, Wilson called on Jones once again, this time for a more urgent purpose, organizing battlefield aid for the American Red Cross. He turned his business over to a trusted associate, put on a Red Cross uniform, and headed for Washington. With the war and the crisis that the war emphasized, there was a degree of, of idealism and otherness in the Red Cross job, a, a chance to do something for humanity, if you will, that was absent in an ordinary peacetime cabinet post. In battle-torn France, Red Cross ambulances are familiar sights. Jones mobilized ambulances, nurses, doctors, and field hospitals at lightning speed. When the troops came home and America celebrated the end of the war, Jones was anxious to return to Houston and resume building his empire. But first, he had one more task to complete, making the Red Cross a permanent international relief agency. As world leaders gathered in France to hammer out the World War I peace agreements, Jones went as an ambassador for his cause. For a young man who had grown up in Tennessee, Paris in 1919 must have seemed like a whole new world. And the proximity to the makers and shakers of the time must have produced its own extraordinary excitement. Jones lobbied hard to create an institution that would address calamities around the world. The Red Cross that we know today. From war-ravaged Europe, he wrote home to Houston that business would have to wait. His letter said, For one to know the conditions existing as I see them, and be content to go about his own affairs, is more than I can understand. Unlike many capitalists in America, Jones divided his life uh, in half and spent much of his adult life trying to help democracy at times at the expense of his practice of capitalism. Jones came home to Houston with a hugely enhanced reputation. No longer just the tycoon. He was now an intimate of the president, which made him a player on the national stage. His future was wide open. Roaring Twenties. Like the nation at large, Houston was booming. Jesse Jones was in the middle of it all. He owned the leading newspaper, one of the largest banks, and the grandest hotels in town. He owned the most ornate picture palaces and a huge portion of the city's downtown office space. One booster said Jones Buildings placed one on top of another, would reach two miles into the sky. Mary Gibbs Jones finally got her divorce. Jesse and Mary's wedding was a small affair, and her first marriage was never spoken of again. Though they'd have no children of their own, 
Mary and Jesse would raise Mary's granddaughter, Audrey Louise, like the child they never had. The newlyweds soon went to New York City. Jesse developed 12 buildings there and became the top financial officer in the Democratic Party. Then he pulled off a coup that astounded everyone. It was time for the Democratic National Committee to choose a city for the party's 1928 convention. And Jesse Jones saw his chance. To outbid the big northern cities, he wrote out a blank check and handed it to the committee. Fill her in for whatever it takes, he said. On behalf of Houston and the entire state of Texas, I extend you a most cordial invitation to hold the Democratic National Convention in Houston. The people are skeptical, obviously, to go to a, a kind of a frontier city in the heat of June with, with not much air conditioning. But they believe in Jones. They're persuaded by Jones' energy, his, his optimism to say, yes, this can be done. Bringing the convention to a southern city for the first time since the Civil War would elevate Houston and the South with one bold move. There will be no north and no south, no east and no west. Just one for all and all for one for the Democrats in 1928. It was one thing to write a huge check. The trouble was Jones also promised a convention hall to seat 25,000 people. It had to be built in less than six months. He worked around the clock with his architects to finish the building. The failure would reflect not just on Jones, but on the whole South. When the time came, the hall was ready, but the visitors soon discovered something they hadn't expected. The delegates uh, are stunned at the heat steaming up from Houston in June, and the convention hall itself, of course, is not air-conditioned. Apparently, it's like sitting in an oven listening to political speeches for hours at a time. Massachusetts, got 36 votes for Governor Smith. The convention's nominee would be Al Smith of New York, who went on to lose resoundingly to Herbert Hoover. But the convention was clearly a victory for Houston and for Jesse Jones. I think he created a different image for the South in national politics by portraying the South as the future uh, uh, of America, not necessarily just simply that a painful past uh, in our history. Meanwhile, Jones continued to develop his city. In 1929, he completed what he considered his crowning achievement, a 35-story Art Deco skyscraper to be home to Gulf Oil and Jones National Bank of Commerce. When the building opened, it seemed the good times would never end. One month later, the stock market crashed, the decade's economic house of cards collapsed, and a downward spiral of devastation began that seemingly could not be stopped. first time in two decades, Jesse Jones stopped building. Instead, at age 55, he took on a new job, helping rebuild the nation's economy from the ashes of the Great Depression. Saving the banks of Texas had taken three days. Rescuing the entire country would be a different story. By 1932, the country was really in a desperate condition. A fifth of the labor force were out of work. People were living in Hooverville, so-called. People were starving to death. There was no system of federal relief. People began to talk about revolution. <laughs> 
And it was a very, very scary time and a very desperate time. In 1932, Republican President Herbert Hoover appealed to Jesse Jones to bring his business skills to Washington. Though a Democrat, Jones was sworn in by the Republican administration to serve on a new federal agency called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. The RFC was supposed to make government loans to troubled banks and railroads in hopes of reviving the economy. But President Hoover was afraid to use the RFC. He saw it as a dangerous intrusion by government into business. The Hoover RFC was very limited. All it could do was to loan money to financial institutions. Uh, when Congress in 1932 tried to extend this to make it possible for the RFC to make loans to municipalities and states and entrepreneurs, Hoover angrily vetoed that as state socialism or state capitalism. From his first days at the RFC, Jesse Jones was desperate to do more. He knew the RFC's potential was being squandered. That if Hoover used it aggressively, the nation's economic catastrophe could be averted. Jones would soon get his chance to show what the RFC could do. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. When President Franklin Roosevelt took office in March of 1933, he boldly promised to try anything and everything to defeat the Depression. Thousands of new government employees streamed into Washington to carry out his experiment in government called the New Deal. We got there as young people out to save the country. And there was nothing else we talked about. It was almost a religion. We were dedicated day and night to resolving the economic problems of the Depression and putting America back on its feet. Though Jones did not consider himself a new dealer, he gave his full support for Roosevelt's agenda. He lobbied the new president, spelling out what the RFC could do. And Roosevelt recognized that Jones' close ties to the financial world would be crucial to his success. The business community regarded Roosevelt and the Roosevelt administration with the utmost suspicion, verging on dislike. And here was uh, a financier, wealthy in his own right, uh, who had come in with Herbert Hoover, who was willing to be and continued to be the bridge to the financial community. Roosevelt named Jones chairman of the RFC and gave him the go-ahead to take the RFC into battle. Neither man knew at the beginning how extraordinarily effective their collaboration would be, nor how bitterly it would end. As a banker and a businessman, Jesse Jones believed there was one chief obstacle to recovery, a lack of credit. And Jesse Jones understood credit as well as anyone in America. Bankers were hoarding their cash reserves, too frightened to make loans. But Jones realized that more credit, not less, was needed. He proposed a solution that traditional bankers considered far too extreme, that the federal government buy stock in banks through the RFC, in effect becoming part owner of the nation's banks while infusing them with a new supply of cash to lend. And that was a venture of government into the private sector beyond anything that uh, Hoover, the Republicans, or most conservative Democrats would previously have tolerated. It was a radical innovation. Some saw it as a dangerous step. This is the perfect example of socialism at work. Uh, the, the, the government moving into the means of production and distribution uh, and actually putting its money in it 
receiving profits back to the government from that stock, exercising stockholders' voting rights, uh, which Jones did sometimes. Okay? You're not going to find a greater example of, of socialism uh, in American history than that. Though it may have looked that way to Wall Street, to Jones it was simply good business. And the RFC was taking a lead role in the historic shift of financial power from New York to Washington. The fact that bankers were reliant on Washington, in some cases, for their very existence, for their continued existence, that serves as a very potent reminder that the, the world has changed, that uh, Washington no longer comes hat in hand to New York, but the New York banking system is coming down to Washington to negotiate its very survival, and Jones is right in the middle of that process. As conditions improved, the banks bought back their stocks and all of the federal government's money was returned with interest. His zealous attention to the bottom line set Jones apart from most New Dealers, many of whom believed the solution to the Depression was to spend government money as liberally as possible. Jones held a far more conservative view. Even so, he used the clout of the RFC to make American businesses more accountable, especially when it came to the railroads. Railroads were the nation's biggest industry, but by 1933, one-third of them were bankrupt and the rest were on the brink. The nation's primary transportation system was about to grind to a halt. Jones rose to the challenge the RFC made huge loans to dozens of railroads. But Jesse Jones had some firm ideas about how businessmen asking for government help ought to act. Where do you live? Jones asked the chief executives of one huge line. New York City, they replied. He pointed out that the closest their railroad got to New York was New Orleans and told the men to move south they wouldn't get their government loan. You live too far from your tracks, he said. He didn't stop there. Some of the railroad men asking for government help earned more than $100,000 a year, a million in today's dollars. So when the Southern Pacific asked for a loan, Jones said yes, as long as their executives cut their salaries in half and used the money instead to rehire workers and improve the rail lines. Suddenly, he is the most powerful person in the world financial community, and they had to come to his office, sometimes hat in hand, and uh, uh, he was not above um, pulling their strings every now and then <laughs> to kind of let them know that uh, uh, that Times were changing. Hmm. Going against the grain of his fellow businessmen, Jones told American capitalists more than once that partnership with the government was the key to their survival. It was Jesse Jones who made the transition to an enormously important role for government. And being himself a successful financier, successful banker, himself having money, unlike many of the, new, of the other New Dealers, uh, he gave a respectability, a credibility to it. But Jesse Jones' concept of an activist government did not go as far as many New Dealers wanted. From the first days of the New Deal, he butted heads in particular with Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture. Well, Wallace and Jones, I think you can say, represented the clash between the pragmatists and the idealists. Jones was a pragmatist. He was a can-do fellow. Uh, Wallace uh, was a dreamer, an idealist. Uh, he wanted to remake America. The government's response to plunging farm prices brought their two philosophies into sharp relief. Mr. Wallace, from Mr. Jones's viewpoint, was a little bit wild. Uh, Mr. Wallace, at one point, recommended that the farmers plow under 
the third row as a way of reducing the supply of uh, food. They're plowing up cotton instead of picking it down Dixie Way as a part of President Roosevelt's stupendous program to stop excessive production and boost prices. Mr. Jones thought that this was a harebrained uh, scheme. Jones proposed a different solution. Instead of destroying surplus farm crops, he loaned farmers money and stored their crops as collateral. That took the farm goods off the saturated market and put money in the desperate farmers' hands. When prices rose, farmers sold the warehouse crops and paid back the government loans with interest. Jones' clever use of credit was getting the wheels of the American economy moving again. And the RFC was becoming one of the most potent institutions in the nation. By 1938, every corner of the United States had been touched by RFC activities. RFC loans built a huge aqueduct to bring water across the desert to Los Angeles. This 18-mile tunnel costing $220 million is being financed by the RFC. I have inspected the property today in the work, and I am well pleased with it. RFC funds brought electricity and appliances to homes never before within the reach of power lines. Jesse Jones is not just uh, loaning billions of dollars to thousands of banks around the country. He's also financing the purchase of water pumps, toasters, and washing machines in rural villages and distant farmhouses throughout America. The RFC provided capital to build the Bay Bridge across San Francisco Bay, one of the longest bridges in the world. His vast and growing empire did not go unnoticed. The Saturday Evening Post magazine reported, next to the president, no man in the government, and probably in the United States, wields greater power. He had billions of dollars at his disposal, and he could give it anywhere he wanted to without the approval of anybody. And the congressmen knew that, uh, and they would be showing up all the time, uh, calling all the time by his office. I don't think anybody else had that kind of authority. In some ways, even Roosevelt didn't have that kind of freedom to distribute cash. By the end of the 1930s, Jesse Jones had a new nickname, the Fourth Branch of Government. And Fortune magazine dubbed his RFC the House of Jesse. He became famous for his even temper and laconic manner. President Roosevelt quipped, Jones is the only man in Washington who can say yes or no intelligently 24 hours a day. I have seen him sit in rooms with bankers from New York and other big cities with their engineers and their slide rules. Mr. Jones would always come to the answer quicker than the fellows with the slide rule. And it was all in his head because he only had an eighth grade education. But he had that powerful presence that just convinced people that whatever he said was going to be right. And what made his banker's heart proudest was that the RFC's massive recovery efforts had made a profit for the U.S. government. And it was all calculated to the very single penny, and he took pride in the fact that every penny that he had loaned was in fact repaid. But it was more than his business skills that accounted for the RFC's success. Though formal in public, in private his personal warmth and concern for his employees set him apart from other Washington bureaucrats. In Houston and again in Washington, people who worked for him were unusually attached to him and they would remain loyal for years and years. It was his RFC family and that gave him some degree of independence and power too. Among his Capitol Hill cronies he was known for an arm around the shoulder, a salty story, and sharing a bottle of bourbon. Congressmen in particular always found him available. He was constantly in touch with Capitol Hill. No matter who he was talking to, he would interrupt the conversation to take 
a call from a congressman or a senator. I particularly remember his turning to me and saying, I never miss one of those calls. With his widespread popularity, it was no surprise when Jones emerged as a possible vice presidential candidate in 1940. He spent a tense day or two at the National Convention waiting to see which way the political winds would blow. Roosevelt wanted Henry Wallace, Jones's rival, on the ticket instead. One year later, President Roosevelt did invite Jones into the inner fold, appointing him Secretary of Commerce. Jones agreed to take the job only if he could hold on to his RFC authority. It would be an exceptional concentration of power in one man. Congress quickly passed a joint resolution to allow him to hold both positions. Finally, Jesse Jones would have the cabinet position that was first offered by Woodrow Wilson. And he wasted little time putting his mark on cabinet meetings. Buried deep in a government warehouse is a piece of my Uncle Jess that's been carefully stored away. It's the table my great uncle had made when he joined President Roosevelt's cabinet. Uncle Jess couldn't see or hear who was talking at the other end of the old table. I just can't believe the size of that table. Mm -hmm. So typical of my uncle, he had a new table built and it was used for cabinet meetings by the next four presidents. Roosevelt, President of the United States, Jesse H. Jones, Secretary of Commerce. Mm -hmm. He designed it so each person could see everyone at the table. In fact, I've got a copy of a photograph. It's just amazing to see this. Now there's Jesse right there. I'll see at the end uh -huh. To see where Roosevelt's cabinet fought the Great Depression, where they figured out how to win World War II. Uncle Jess sat here at meetings for five years, right next to his arch enemy, Henry Wallace. So much history was made at this table, and Uncle Jess was right at the heart of it all. Jones' extraordinary authority now included 32 agencies and billions of dollars with which to promote the return of American productivity. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation and its subsidiaries conduct the most gigantic business enterprise and serious of business enterprises the country has ever known. It came just in time, with the Depression still not licked the nation faced an even greater emergency. When the war began in Europe, the United States lacked the means to fight a war. It didn't lack only airplanes, ships, tanks, guns. It lacked the means to produce them. We had makeshift supplies, makeshift equipment, stovepipes for cannons, Bags of flour for bombs, and trucks were labeled tanks. <laughs> One of the great problems was to persuade industry to undertake defense production. It's a big changeover. Where we used to make hubcaps, now we're making helmets. Jones played a major role in that process because the Reconstruction Finance Corporation had the wherewithal to lend the money to the industries that were necessary to produce the equipment without which fighting a war was impossible. More than a year before the U.S. entered World War II, President Roosevelt directed Jones to fund the militarization of American industry. Transforming the still crippled U.S. economy would require every ounce of Jones's ingenuity. It is the purpose of the nation 
to build now with all possible speed every machine and arsenal and factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. At the Brown Shipyard, Houston, Texas, here for the launching of seven fighting ships, Navy Secretary Frank Knox, Commerce Secretary Jesse Jones, and sponsor... Jones's contribution in mobilization was indispensable. It was the RFC that provided the funds, and it was Mr. Jones that provided the energy behind the effort. Want to live in a nice modern balloon? Here outside the national capital, the Defense Housing Division of the RFC is experimenting to make exactly that possible. Funding the greatest industrial buildup in the history of the world inevitably put Jones in the public eye. Commerce Secretary and Mrs. Jesse Jones, here for inspection. He financed it as a defense housing project. With his new, more visible role, he came under greater scrutiny. And for the first time in his decade of government service, he became the target of serious criticism. There was a general feeling in Washington that the war effort was lagging, and some of the blame was, was pushed toward Jesse Jones, who was argued that the RSC wasn't lending fast enough. The main issue was what the press called the National Rubber Emergency. A modern army runs on rubber, and with 97% of the world's supply in Japanese hands, the U.S. lacked the natural rubber it needed to fight the war. Here are two simple rules for this rubber emergency. First, turn in all the old rubber anywhere and everywhere. Secondly, cut the use of your car. Despite recycling efforts, a synthetic substitute was desperately needed. Jones RFC funded experimental synthetic rubber plants, but charges arose that he had spread himself too thin and the effort was moving too slowly. The Washington Post, owned by Eugene Meyer, a former RFC chairman, published a scathing editorial blasting Jones for delays in the program. In this editorial, the program was being delayed by Jones' boundless ambition. Well, this upset him, naturally. He was furious about it. Meyer's stinging attack shattered Jones' normally even temper. The next day, the two of them happened to be at a dinner at the Willard Hotel, and uh, Jones came up to Meyer, and he was so furious, he grabbed him by the lapels and started shaking him. The brawl was reported the next morning with great amusement. But there was nothing funny about the growing feud between Jones and Henry Wallace. He all but called Jesse Jones a traitor to the war effort. And Jones responded by calling Wallace a liar. The dispute soon spread beyond rubber, in part because Roosevelt put Wallace in charge of other parts of the war mobilization effort, guaranteeing that the two men would continue to battle not just over ideology, but over turf as well. With the battle spilling over into the press, hearings were launched to determine whether Jones had in fact delayed mobilization. The outcome vindicated Jones and his RFC, but it did little to dampen the feud between Wallace and Jones. President Roosevelt removed some of their duties to try to keep the peace. But the fallout from their feud didn't stop there. In 1944, when Roosevelt ran for his fourth term, the Democratic Party insisted he drop Henry Wallace as his running mate for the more moderate Harry Truman. To compensate Wallace, Roosevelt let him take his pick among several cabinet posts. Wallace chose the Commerce Department, which Jones had made into one of the most powerful positions in government. Jesse Jones was not told of the arrangement. He attended Roosevelt's fourth inauguration on a cold January day in 1945 standing beside the sickly president. 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you solemnly swear. It was a brief ceremony, and after attending the formal luncheon, the Secretary of Commerce returned to the hotel where he and Mary lived. The desk clerk handed Jones a letter from the White House. After 12 years of service to Franklin Roosevelt, the president had fired him and was replacing him with Henry Wallace. The day after President Roosevelt fired him, Uncle Jess came here to his office across from the White House. He worked at this very desk to write his statement to the press. He had accomplished so much for the president, it just didn't seem right. When President Roosevelt offered him the chairmanship of the Federal Reserve, or just about anything else he wanted, Uncle Jess said no. But he wasn't one to brood. He got ready to return to Houston. But first, he made sure Henry Wallace wouldn't get his hands on the RFC. Jesse Jones, retiring Secretary of Commerce, testifies before the Senate Commerce Committee on a resolution to divorce the RFC lending agency from the Department of Commerce. The nomination of Henry Jones used his influence with Congress to make sure that even if Henry Wallace got his position, he wouldn't get the power. The man who holds the vast responsibilities contained in the RFC should be one of proven and sound business experience. The Senate did confirm Henry Wallace as Secretary of Commerce. That the powers of the RFC but took away the, the RFC. Such a way as to carry out the objectives. Jesse Jones would be the first and last individual in American history to hold such enormous economic power. On their return to Houston, he and Mary settled into their apartment atop Jesse's Lamar Hotel, built on the site of his first lumber yard. And after the frenetic years in Washington, they enjoyed their extended family and granddaughter, Audrey. He took back the reins of his business empire and continued to shape the city. It was totally his skyline. I mean, you'd have to say that the buildings that stood up were the Jesse Jones buildings. And in those days, they weren't as tall as they are today, but they were the tallest we had, and they were all his. And it was certainly his stamp on this city, very physically visual. Accelerating a long practice of philanthropy, the Joneses established scholarships so that thousands could attend college, helping young people from all backgrounds get the best chance they could at a college education. Politically, Jones decided that after Roosevelt's 12 years in office, the Democrats had been in power too long. A change would be healthy for the nation, he told a friend. Though he continued to back Democrats for Congress, he would support Republican presidential candidates for the rest of his life. And with the emergency of the Depression and war over, Jones believed there was no longer a role for the RFC. It should be given a decent burial, he said. But he never renounced his conviction that government should take an active hand in the economic affairs of the nation. The importance of Jesse Jones and the RFC is to remind people uh, that government is not the enemy. The government is one of the instrumentalities that free people have uh, to improve economic conditions and economic opportunity. When Jesse Jones died in 1956 at age 82, his funeral procession traveled a paved highway that had been a dirt road when he arrived in Houston more than half a century earlier. He was still Mr. Houston. He molded his community in a way few American cities have ever been shaped by one man. The vast fortune he'd taken such a delight in making, he left to a charitable foundation with directions it be used to nurture his adopted hometown. I suppose I'll be lucky to get to heaven, he'd once joked, but if I do, 
I'll be happier there if it's just a mite like Houston. Log on to PBS.org to discover more about Jesse H. Jones and how his benevolent use of capitalism helped save our economic system during the Great Depression and mobilized American industry to fight World War II. To order a VHS of Jesse H. Jones, send $24.95 to Houston Public Television. Jesse H. Jones Video, 4513 Cullen Boulevard, Houston, Texas, 77004. Or call 1-800-364-8300. Production funding for Brother Can You Spare a Billion, the story of Jesse H. Jones, was provided by Houston Endowment. This is history's best.